regional advisor for nursing and allied health technician in the Pan American Health Organization. The year 2021 has been designated by WHO as the year of the healthcare, health and care workers to value the essential role that they have played in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. In the region of the Americas, we have a total of 8.4 million nursing professionals, and they represent 56% of the total healthcare workforce. Advanced the practice nurses began in the United States and Canada more than 50 years ago, but now they are expanding globally. The COVID-19 pandemic can be an unprecedented opportunity to take on roles that expand the access to care. The advanced practice nurses can take on leadership roles to address the systematic health challenges that we can see in a near future and that we can see right now. The burden of chronic, of chronic disease the increased the number of aging population and the impact of emerging factors such as climate change and migration are important factors to increase the need of nurses in healthcare. Nurses can make most of this moment and to overcome the health challenges affecting our world. Since 2013, PAHO has been working with the collaborating centers and other relevant Latin American networks to implement advanced nursing practice in countries of the region where the role is not established. Our work is mainly to collaborative work to advance the preparation of nurses into master and doctoral level, engage and influence decision makers, chief nursing officers, legislators, and other key stakeholders in Latin America and the Caribbean, focus APN service delivery in primary health care, and define and optimize complementary registered nurse and advanced practice nurse roles in models of primary health care. Before to start, I have to say that this webinar was organized jointly by Dr. Denise Bryant Lucosius and Andrea Bauman from the McMaster University School of Nursing and Jennifer Dorn from the University of Columbia School of Nurse. Both institutions are PAHO WHO collaborating center, and I want to thank them for their efforts to have this webinar. To start, I would like to invite Dr. Fernando Menezes, head of the unit of Human Resources for Health, Department of Health Systems and Services, to give your words. Thank you. Dr. Fernando Menezes, the floor is yours. Good. Perfect, Sylvia. Welcome to all the participants of this webinar. I want to begin by thanking Dr. Sylvia Cassiani for hosting in moderating this event today. I acknowledge also the collaboration of the schools of nursing from McMaster University and from Columbia University in the nursing related activities throughout our region. And a very special thanks to our speakers and commentators. I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to share a brief thought on innovative ways to respond to COVID. And of course, my reference when I started talking about lessons learned from the pandemic 
is that it's essential to highlight the impressive achievements in ideas brought about by the nursing profession. It's also never too much to thank all healthcare professionals on this webinar today for your hard work and commitment during this challenge time. Among the heroes who have emerged from disguises, you have risked your health to save patients. Our countries are indebted to you. Therefore, my tribute goes to the health workers and those who lost their lives in the fight, in particular, the nurses who continue at the forefront of the pandemic. Of course, as we move forward, we know that the pandemic continues to evolve and the healthcare community must continue to deliver high quality care to all patients. Despite member states' efforts, we have tragically seen a rise in the number of cases and deaths in some countries of our region. The scenario is still of an active public health emergency. The COVID-19 virus is not receding, nor is the pandemic starting to go away. The emerging data also confirm the disproportionate impact of the disease on different communities, different countries, and different, uh, ac different ethnic groups, different group ages and race. Health systems are under immense, immense pressure. At the heart of the health systems, the health workforce experience constraints and a continuous overload. Fortunately, in one sign, we've made significant progress in understanding the disease, our ability to deal with it, and our efforts to help patients suffering from it. Uh, for instance, I'm pleased to report that 33 of our 35 members started immunization last week and over 155 million doses have been delivered in our region so far. PAHU has joined the vaccination efforts, helping to create a more equitable vaccine distribution through the COVAX facility. If one side vaccines are coming, it's still several months away for most people in your region to get the shot, the vaccination. Until they arrive and until most of our population is vaccinated, we must continue to do works, wear masks, maintain our distance, avoid large gatherings, and follow the guidance of our local health authorities. Following this public health, very simple public health measures is especially important with holidays coming up in many of our countries. People cannot let down their guard by engaged in close contact with others. As the virus surges and hospitalizations rise, you urgently need to scale our capacity to provide adequate care. Once again, it comes to what we are going to see here today. The advancing nursing practice experience delivers such a power to health systems. The webinar aims to continue a very stimulating discussion about the expanding nurses role disseminate experience and on how advanced practice nurses have contributed to our response to this pandemic. We must bring in this moment forward the best ideas and innovations to support better health workforce arrangements for working together. Our approach is very consistent and indeed goes to the core of the PAHO's mission, the Pan-American Health Organization mission. We constantly gather information and evidence to inform and collaborate with our help member states. Finally, it's also very important to note that the World Health Organization designated this year as the International Year of Health and Care Workers, promoting the International Year of Nursing and Midwifery Professionals Continuity. At the regional level, our unit, the Unity of Human Resources for Health, planned a, seri a series of events, which started with much honor today with this event. I take then the opportunity to invite everyone to follow the PAHO's website and participate in the forthcoming events. PAHO advocates for investments in the health workforce in general and works towards seeing nurses with expanded role, many in primary health care. These investments require a linkage be 
beyond the health sector. It depends on the intersectorial coordination that includes health, education, finance, job creation, and professional regulation. This is very important things to be articulated if you want to have to expand in the proper way the works of the nurses. Finally, as a part of the Department of Health Systems and Services, we are working to strengthen the health systems to respond to the population needs. The nurses, in our view, are the center of the response. So I wish you all an excellent discussion and thank you very much. Over to you, Silvia. Thank you, Dr. Fernando. Thank you for your participation. We will go ahead and we will have a presentation about the role of advanced practice nurse in primary health care. I would like to invite Carrie here. Carrie obtained the, her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from University of Windsor and Master of Nursing and Advanced Graduate Diploma, Advanced Nursing Practice from Athabasca University. Carrie currently holds the position of Nurse Practitioner, Coordinator and Clinical Lead for the Waterloo Wellington Nurse-Led Outreach Team. I would like to invite Carrie to start her presentation. And for the participants, if you have any question to Carrie, please keep this question in, in the chat box. You can write your question and by the end, we will have a discussion with her. Carrie, please, it's your turn. Thank you very much. Carrie, please open your microphone. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to, to present and speak today. I'm going to speak to the nurse practitioner role, primary health care, and the nurse-led outreach team and our response to COVID-19. So in terms of objectives, the, the two main objectives I'm going to speak to today are in describing the nurse practitioner role in the nurse-led outreach teams for improving access to primary health care in long-term care homes in Ontario. The second objective is to provide examples of the nurse practitioner role and outcomes in response to health, health service needs resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. These include clinical, leadership, education, and research roles. For the nurse practitioner role in Ontario and Canada, a master's degree is required from an NP-specific graduate education program. The nurse practitioner role is autonomous and involves an expanded scope of practice. This includes the ability to diagnose and treat illnesses, order and interpret tests, prescribe medications, perform procedures, admit and discharge from hospital. Nurse practitioners work in a variety of settings. These include community, long-term care or nursing homes, hospital inpatients, outpatients, ambulatory care and public health. In terms of the nurse led outreach team or NLOT for short, these have been in Ontario since 2008. There's 18 teams that are established in Ontario across 14 health regions, and these provide clinical support to long-term care homes. The nurse-led outreach teams provide integrated nursing and primary health care service mm -hmm. to avoid transfers to the emergency department, prevent hospital admissions, and reduce length of stay. The teams may have registered nurses, all nurse practitioners, or a combination of registered nurses and nurse practitioners. The Waterloo Wellington Nurse Led Outreach Team has one NP and three registered nurses. This is the team I directly support as the NP, where I'm also the coordinator and clinical lead for this team. In terms of COVID-19 pandemic and long-term care, 
we know that the residents in long-term care homes are requiring more complex care associated with frailty, multiple chronic conditions, and mental health conditions. 73% of all COVID-19 deaths in Canada have occurred in long-term care homes, affecting both residents and staff. Many homes were unprepared for the pandemic. During this pandemic, the nurse-led outreach teams expanded their roles and responsibilities to provide additional support and resources. The next four slides are going to speak to nurse practitioner roles and examples of how this support was implemented in the long-term care homes. So the very first role is the NP role related to clinical care. So this involves provision of primary care in long-term care, which also includes acute episodic care, chronic disease management, palliative and end of life care. We coordinate, manage and facilitate care for residents that's both in person and remotely. We also provide ongoing response to changes in health and health needs related to COVID-19. COVID-19 identified gaps and nurse practitioners and the nurse-led outreach teams supported these needs. We also lead and coordinate the nurse-led outreach team. For the nurse practitioner role related to leadership, here the teams implemented innovative approaches to care delivery, such as virtual care, improved and supported clinical practice, developed policies, tools, and resources, such as flow sheets and order sets. We've also promoted health system integration, such as access to specialists to improve care advocated at the government level for additional NPs and expansion of the nurse led outreach teams. Additionally, in terms of the nurse practitioner leadership, I currently provide the leadership for the nurse led outreach team collaborative committee that is comprised of all provincial teams. Nurse practitioner role education led the development of webinars to educate long-term care and retirement home staff. This included infection control and prevention practices, emergency department diversion practices, goals of care discussions, physical assessment. We've provided education to support homes in outbreak to prevent the spread of infection, manage COVID infections, and also to prevent hospital transfers. Educated staff and system level partners about new practices to support residents in their care setting, such as care pathways. We've also increased care capacity through staff education. In terms of research, so I am the co-lead for a virtual care quality improvement initiative in response to COVID-19. This was an innovative practice change that supported the use of virtual care models. And in this, we developed pro the actual program, including the toolkit and resources, developed flow sheets, guidelines, and algorithms, also provided training, webinars, and support. In terms of additional research, I'm also currently participating in research studies related to nurse practitioners in long-term care during COVID-19, as well as a COVID-19 immunity and vaccine study. So in terms of integration of nurse practitioner role dimensions, so there's multiple dimensions that were integrated in supporting long-term care. These include building nursing staff capacity, implementing, implementing best practices and innovation, optimizing resident-centered care, and reducing emergency department transfers. These next four slides will share data in our regional area. And I'd like to preface this to identify that we did not experience restrictions in the ability to transfer during, during to hospital during COVID, but implemented initiatives and strategies to support providing care within the long-term care setting. In terms of outcomes for emergency department transfer. So this slide represents data that is related to emergency department transfers again within our region. 
So you will note that the blue bar represents the emergency department transfers in 2019-20, and the green bar represents emergency department transfers in 2020-21, which is reflective of the COVID-19 pandemic. Overall, there was a reduction in all quarters related to emergency department transfers during the COVID-19 pandemic. The next slide speaks to outcomes related to hospital admissions. And again, the blue bar on the left represents hospital admissions in 2019-20, and the green bar represents hospital admissions in 2020-21, which is during the COVID pandemic. Again, you will identify that there was a reduction in all quarters in terms of hospital admissions. This next slide represents our virtual care study results. So the virtual care study was initiated from an identified need and opportunity during COVID-19 to support the residents within their care setting. The graph on the left identifies the long-term care homes that participated in the implementation of virtual care. And the graph on the right represents the homes that did not participate. For the homes that participated, you will identify a reduction in emergency department transfers as well. This next slide represents the rate of hospitalizations per 100 beds, again related to our virtual care study. So for hospital admissions, the graph on the left identifies those homes that participated in our virtual care study, and the graph on the right represents the homes that did not participate. Overall, there was a reduction in hospitalization as well for those long-term care homes that participated in our study. So first, summarizing the impact of the nurse practitioner role in the nurse led outreach team. So this role was essential for providing timely access to care and innovative practice change in long-term care homes in response to COVID-19. Improved infection control practices, we supported staff to implement best COVID-19 practices, worked with families to provide timely information, supported the delivery of primary care within the long-term care home, and also improved end-of-life care. We improved care coordination and management through systems integration of long-term care home and hospital care providers. This led to the avoidance of unnecessary transfers to the emergency department and hospital admissions. The nurse practitioner and nurse led outreach team program continue to have a critical role in supporting long term care as we have and continue to navigate through this COVID-19 pandemic. This last slide is my contact information. Please feel free to contact me directly if you have any further questions or would like any further information on our program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carrie. Very nice to hear about the outcomes, about your work. And I would like to know after maybe if we have time about the virtual care model that you have implemented. I'm sure that uh, in other countries, they want to hear about these virtual care models and also the difference that you have between your work as a nurse practitioner and the work of a registered nurse in, in, in the clinic, you no? Know? Because this is the question that we always have in Latin America countries. How is the difference between both roles? Thank you so much. And it's my pleasure now to, to invite Dr. Marlene McHugh Dr. Marlene McHugh is an associate professor of nursing at Columbia University in New York. She maintains a faculty practice at Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx, where she co-developed the palliative care service. Dr. McHugh has a clinical nursing background in medical surgical nursing, oncology, critical care, and as well in primary health care. 
She received her graduate degree as a family nurse practitioner and her doctoral degree from Columbia University. And she holds a post-master certificate as an adult geriatric acute care nurse practitioner from the University of Pennsylvania. It's a pleasure to have Dr. McHugh with us and to hear your experience about what we have learned from COVID-19 and the work of APNs in healthcare. Dr. Marlene, it's your floor. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for allowing me to share my experience as an advanced practice nurse during the COVID surge in New York. And you're hearing from me, but I'm not much different than most advanced practice nurses who are in practice in the five boroughs in New York City. So I just wanna make sure I can. So I know that you went through my nursing background a little bit. Um, I think that this is helpful in terms of framing what I did during the COVID surge. So I have a very strong background in primary care and a very strong background in acute care as a registered nurse. And the palliative care service that I work in is centered in a hospital under a department of family medicine. Our service functions 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we also follow patients in the hospital and in an outpatient clinic. Our service is staffed by physicians and nurse practitioners, and nurse practitioners on our service function in the same level as their physician counterparts in, in ordering and caring for patients. So at Montefiore Medical Center, that is where my faculty practices, and I spend three days a week there at Montefiore seeing patients. If you are familiar with what happened in New York, all the health systems were impacted very quickly in terms of the number of COVID patients that we saw. By the middle of uh, March, we were having trickles of patients. And by mid-May, we were at the height of our capacity in terms of the hospitalization. So this provides a nice timeline of what we saw within a month period. Within two weeks of patients beginning to present to the hospital, our outpatient clinics moved to telehealth and our ICU capacity began to prepare. At the height of the surge, we were functioning at 300% of our ICU capacity. My inpatient practice, our consult service is palliative care. So as you can imagine, we were impacted significantly from the early onset of the COVID pandemic. Our service provided 24-hour access by in-person consults, e-consults, electronic consults that could be sent within the health system or remote consults that could be done telephonically. In New York State, where I practice, uh, the governor of the state expanded scope of practice for all providers, including nurse practitioners and physician's assistants registered nurses and MDs. We quickly developed as an institution protocols that could manage patients across settings 24 hours a day with specialty backup, but also with clear guidelines for primary teams. So in terms of symptom management, ventilator withdrawal, advanced care planning and goals of care conversations. These were standard protocols that were put on portals so that all health professionals could access. As you know, we went to visitor restrictions right away. And as you can imagine, the impact of that was significant, especially for the volume of patients who had end of life issues. Most of our work was done either by a video platform or by telephone with patients' families. And one of the things that I'd like to mention, because I think that this is important, in the States, there was um, a lot of press about the pandemic and what to expect and what was happening in the hospitals. 
And that was very helpful for us as healthcare professionals. Families understood what was happening and why they couldn't come in. And over and over again, families were always grateful for the conversation and for the healthcare workers that were providing the care to their family members. We were quickly impacted with the need for advanced care planning and our nurse practitioners and physicians could not manage all of this. Primary teams picked this up and in the clinical setting where I am, a registered nurse with a hospice and oncology background was placed in the emergency room to work alongside the emergency room teams in terms of advanced care planning strategies. The one thing that I can say that is a memory to me clearly is that the inpatient service was constant, constant, constant auditory stimulation. So many of us were going home to settings where we lived in Manhattan, where we were close to hospitals. So this constant stimulation of code calls, respiratory distress, ambulance sirens, it never stopped during that surge. And this really impacted many of us. Many of us would have to close our doors so that we could focus on what we needed to do at that time um, because it was just constant for us. The outpatient piece, I spend one day a week in an outpatient piece. Um, we went to telehealth and as you can imagine, this was very quick and many patients did not have access to the internet. So a lot of our management occurred over the telephone. Outpatient, um, I really did not prepare myself for how complicated this was going to be. It was an incredible challenge for me as a very experienced nurse practitioner to manage patients with complicated illness, trying to keep them out of the emergency room. Patients didn't want to go and we did not have the emergency room capacity to handle them. So without a very strong primary care background, this would have been a a tremendous challenge um, for me. So I want everyone to think about that when they're thinking about planning ahead for workforce issues. My academic piece of me, I spent two days a week teaching and fortunately we planned uh, two to three weeks before the surge happened in New York and we went to a virtual platform. And for myself who has a faculty practice, I would not have been able to survive teaching and practicing without this clear three week block that I had to prepare. The one thing that I wanna mention, any of you who are in academia, the students were interesting. Many were not sure what was really happening and was this really going to happen? And I remember clearly standing up in front of the classroom and mentioning Dr. Fauci, who many did not know, and telling them, this is going to hit. We have two to three weeks. You need to prepare, but you need to follow the science. And following the science will help us guide what the next steps are. So just a brief piece about you know, the personal experience. The news from Italy was terrifying to all of us. We knew that this section of Italy had good health care, and we were very concerned about how this was going to impact New York. We didn't understand the level of contagion initially. We didn't understand if it was six feet, three feet, 10 minutes in a room, what this really meant. Our PPE supply, all of you know, we were lacking PPE across the United States, and this was a great concern for healthcare workers. We didn't understand really what the impact that this was going to have in terms of our family exposure early on. Many people were sleeping in hotels, people were sleeping in garages, people, healthcare workers did not know what to do in those early few weeks. One thing that impacted us greatly at Montefiore is we saw early on our colleagues getting sick and we saw our colleagues dying. At the end of what well, we are not at the end, but out to this point, we've had 28 um, members of the Montefiore health system pass away from COVID. Every day you woke up, every day you took your temperature, every day you took your temperature when you came home. You were looking for symptoms. You were trying to find support 
from your teams, you were trying to find support from your colleagues across the city. I was part of a palliative care nursing group that met virtually and people from across the city talked about what their exposure was. And I think that that was really a wonderful thing to think about when we're planning ahead for the next pandemic, if we have one, um, how to do some virtual and Zoom type of support for nurses and nurse practitioners. Family stressors were enormous for everyone. I can tell you, I have an 89 year old mother. This was a great stress, how we were gonna to continue to give her the support that she needed when many of her children were involved in healthcare and we did not want to expose her, but how are we gonna continue the care that she needed? And stress management, you know, that was something that we learned into this, but I would encourage everyone to be talking to their teams early on about stress management apps that they can use, what's gonna work for them. For myself, I had to shut off. I needed to watch Netflix and then I needed to get up the next day and do go back. Communication, this is very, very important. We had daily clinical updates from the department. We had system-wide updates centered at a, a command center that was structured by critical care and the infectious disease department. Treatment guidelines and advisories were up daily on a portal. So there was not a lot of people, you know, sharing articles that weren't evidence-based. Everything was centralized for providers. At Montefiore, one of the things that really helped them get through this was we have a medical school connected with the health system and they had academic leverage. So pretty much the medical school closed and everyone was deployed from researchers, MD, PhDs to um, faculty. Everyone, it, the focus was all hands on deck. So everyone had to assume a role. Even if you weren't in clinical um, networks for a long time, you had some role to share in this. Also, it was very clear early on that providers needed to be flexible. People who were traditionally used to outpatient clinics may be moved inpatient. So this message was put out to everyone in the health system early on, so there was no surprises. In terms of deployment, Nurse practitioners were deployed, and this was a challenge because many of the nurse practitioners were deployed to RN roles because of our ICU capacity increase. So you can imagine the challenge that this was for people who had been centered in outpatient areas, then moving to acute care environments. And over and over again, this was the group that was extremely stressed that I heard from mostly. In terms of primary care providers, many of the primary care providers, whether it was pediatrics, um, family medicine, internal medicine, they moved to inpatient hospital teams. High risk healthcare providers, nurse practitioners, physicians, PAs, RNs, with health concerns, moved to telehealth. And this was all centralized through your department. Outpatient primary care, I mentioned moved to telehealth. One of the things that was a challenge in outpatient is our whole focus was centered towards the inpatient surge. So there weren't clear protocols in the outpatient arena. And I think that this was a lesson that we all learned and we need to prepare for better the next time around. The other thing that we learned is there was such a need for frequent follow-up of patients and this needed to do, be divided between your teams. So if you were the nurse practitioner used to calling patients every day, you needed to delegate that role to um, a nurse. Sometimes that needed to be delegated to a social worker because there was so much need for medical management. This is an article that I would encourage all of you to look at at some time. In New York um, and across the US, nurse practitioners in outpatient arenas are very similar to family medicine physicians. And at Montefiore, the family medicine service moved from an outpatient model to an inpatient model. So two inpatient teams 
moved to six teams within a two week period. And that those teams were managing 70 patients a day. If you think about this, many of these providers were traditional primary care providers who moved into hospitalist roles. So this article is going to be interesting for nurse practitioners across the country and across the world to look at what was the skill set that was needed when people moved across settings. In terms of support, we had a lot of support offered to us. Um, the one thing that I think was really different, and I would like to share this with you, is we had GoFundMe pages developed by every department to provide additional support outside of the support that the hospital was giving their teams. So this provided meals, on-site meal delivery for teams. It also provided transportation. As you can imagine, most people in New York take the subway and people were afraid to take the subway. So this GoFundMe helped with people getting transportation with Ubers and cabs back and forth to work. What helped us in the chaos? Leadership. Leadership that was calm and visible and confident. Leadership going along with the troops. It was very important to see nursing and medical leadership out there working alongside of the troops. Remember, many um, attending chairmen, heads of departments, in terms of their rank on hospitalist teams, may be at the lowest level under critical care. But everybody needed to be part of this. A command center, this works very well. Command centers in health systems to disseminate evidence-based information. Organized messaging, and the one thing that helped us tremendously, and I can speak for this myself, when I started to see PPE at the hospital entrance every time I walked in, that really you know, helped so many of your fears. The lessons learned. Here I am an experienced nurse, an experienced nurse practitioner. I had never experienced anything like this. I had grown up as a nurse and as a early nurse practitioner during the AIDS epidemic, but this was nothing like I had ever experienced. You needed to learn how to be comfortable in something that was very uncomfortable. Role flexibility, you didn't know what you were gonna do when you went in every day. And so you needed to be flexible on how you were gonna manage that. I think moving forward, broad scope of practice for advanced practice nurses was very helpful for us in New York City. Um, but when I say this, we need to have better cross training for acute and primary care. People need to be able to move within those settings. Workforce planning. When I think about this, I think that academic medicine in New York really was at the front lines. And now they're starting to talk about what worked and what didn't work and what's needed in education. And I would encourage everyone to start to talk to their academic medicine colleagues who were part of this and what they're thinking about in terms of what's needed in education and medicine. One of the things that we're hearing over and over again, besides cross-site training, primary and acute care, is also this concept of incident command. So whoever was the leader that day with the highest level of experience was the person who was in charge of the team. And that could be very hard for people who haven't had that experience. You can read this, my heroes are everyone. To me, the nurses, the respiratory therapists, the patient care technicians, they are the real heroes. They spent the most time with the patients at the bedside. Physicians, nurse practitioners who were deployed, our housekeepers, food service, administrative staff, all of these individuals help the wheel continue through this surge. There wasn't one person, it was a team event. You can't watch this now, but I would encourage all of you to watch this. This is a, a CBS, which is a national network in the United States following the experience at Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx 
during the COVID surge. So if you haven't seen it, I would encourage you all to see it. And it really is a beautiful portrayal of uh, nurses at the bedside and what they live through. So thank you all. And I'll be glad to answer any questions about my experience. Thank you, end. Dr. Marlene. I'm sure that you have so many questions. And uh, as a matter of fact, I, I saw someone that wrote that they have in another country the same experience that you have. So they feel in your words what they, they are feeling right now in, in their countries. Thank you again. And I would like now to invite the comments. It's, uh, we invited the three special and experts to comment about the, the lessons learned from COVID-19. And the first one will be Dr. Maya Goldenberg, she is Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Guelph. Dr. Maya, it's a pleasure to have a philosopher with us and you have your floor right now. Thank you. And thank you so much. Hello, everyone. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. So I think I'm giving you something different now by, getting, by having a philosopher here. Um, I am a philosopher of medicine and healthcare. I uh, work at the University of Guelph, that is in Canada. And I have spent uh, the last number of years studying vaccine hesitancy. I just put out a book on the, on the subject. I studied um, parents who are hesitant about vaccinating their children. And of course, uh, the timing with COVID and COVID vaccines, uh, I couldn't have predicted um, such incredible uh, timeliness of, of, the, of the topic. But so I've been asked today to speak to you about uh, COVID vaccine hesitancy and the role that uh, healthcare workers, especially advanced planning nurses, can play in addressing vaccine concerns among patients. Um, so um, uh, as I mentioned, my work I'll be drawing from is on pediatric vaccination. That was the major focus of vaccine hesitancy research until COVID, of course, and now we've pivoted towards COVID vaccine hesitancy. Um, vaccine hesitancy, I should say, I, I'll define it in, in just a moment, is mostly studied by behavioral scientists. So I'll say a little bit, explain what a philosopher can do to bring, uh, to bring a new perspective to the area. So philosophers, uh, in our training, we, we examine arguments. We, we look at the evidence that is presented. We think about what evidence may be missing from consideration. We test the values and assumptions that go into our reasoning. And then we assess what conclusions are then drawn. So that's what I did in trying to understand vaccine hesitancy. And the conclusions I drew were very different from the usual framing of vaccine hesitancy. And I will, I will share some of them with you. But first, let me define vaccine hesitancy. That, that term refers to a feeling of ambivalence about vaccines. So it is an attitude, not a behavior. And it lies upon a spectrum. There's on one end, there are people who are slightly less than confident about vaccines. And at the other end of the spectrum, you might find people who are extremely concerned about vaccines. As mentioned, an attitude, it is an attitude and it's separate from behavior. The behavior might be vaccine acceptance, vaccine refusal, or maybe partial acceptance of some vaccines, but not others. So vaccine hesitancy can predict the behavior, but it does not guarantee it. And public health scholars agree that we need to keep an eye on the attitude, not just the behavior, in order to protect public health. Now, even with all of the misinformation on the internet and all the fear surrounding vaccines, both prior to COVID and of course, right now during, uh, regarding COVID vaccines, healthcare providers remain the most trusted source for health information, including information about vaccines. And this has been a consistent finding in the research into pediatric vaccine hesitancy. Even vaccine hesitant parents who express mistrust about the system, uh, especially the pharmaceutical industry and its influence on healthcare, they often will still say they trust their healthcare providers. 
And why is that? It seems to be something about the personal connection that people have with their providers. So nurses then can play a pivotal role in helping patients make informed choices about vaccines. Uh, this trust in healthcare providers is also instructive for rethinking vaccine hesitancy. So in my research, as I mentioned, it was on pediatric vaccine hesitancy. I, I found a dominant explanation for vaccine hesitancy, one that gets repeated in the academic literature as well as in popular uh, writing and newspapers as well. And I called this explanation the war on science. And this is what that means. The position uh, the war on science is that there is a lack of scientific understanding as well as misinformation that we get on the internet that's created a problematic relationship between science and the publics. So you see this again and again, something about the public having a problematic relationship with science. And that is why we have vaccine hesitancy. And of course, this understanding of the problem shapes all of the proposed solutions. If lack of accurate information is the problem, then filling that knowledge gap is presumably the solution. And if you look at vaccine communications that are directed at the public, they focus on this. They focus on providing the facts to the people. So you'll find pamphlets and infographics with titles like just the facts about vaccines or separating myths from reality regarding vaccines. And the assumption behind these kinds of crafted health campaigns is that providing accurate scientific information will make everyone want to get vaccines. And this is because poor scientific literacy is what is holding people back from being vaccinated. This is, this is the largely held assumption. And to be fair, in some ways, the explanation of scientific illiteracy being the cause of vaccine hesitancy, it seems to fit. It seems to fit with some of the behaviors that we see. When, when we hear people say things like vaccines are not safe or vaccines are not effective or not necessary, they seem to be contradicting the scientific consensus. And of course, the consensus is very strong regarding childhood vaccinations. So it certainly looks like a problem of scientific misunderstanding when you have non-experts challenging the expert view on vaccines. However, there is a lot of evidence against this claim that vaccine hesitancy arises due to scientific illiteracy. Um, first, if science illiteracy were the problem, we should expect to see some kind of impact on vaccine attitudes and behaviors in places where there's been a lot of investment in these public health campaigns about vaccines. Yet, it's well known that these, these campaigns don't seem to have much impact. Uh, vaccine up, uptake and vaccine refusal, have uh, those, their rates have stayed uh, steady for, for decades. And vaccine hesitancy has even risen, a slow rise, but, but rising nonetheless. Uh, you would also expect the least educated people to be the most vaccine hesitant, but this is not the case. The research shows that highly educated people display the most polarized views on vaccines. They are among the strongest vaccine supporters, but they are also the most insistent vaccine refusers. When I look towards the social science research, there's a lot of research interviews and surveys of vaccine hesitant parents. I can see that parents understand the scientific consensus. They know what public health officers and healthcare professionals think. They tell that much in their narratives. What they do is they question the integrity of the claims. They think there's something unsavory about those pronouncements on vaccines. So scientific misunderstanding doesn't seem to be the problem here. I would say it's a problem of not, trust, not trusting the expert source. So the science illiteracy thesis has the problem that it brings, the wrong, it brings in wrong assumptions about how people incorporate scientific information into their beliefs and into their decision-making. It is wrong to assume that vaccine acceptance is an entirely cognitive exercise, where if you understand the science, then you will choose vaccines. Healthcare decisions are more complicated than that. They are made with consideration of scientific evidence, certainly, but that evidence is translated for public consumption through many interpretive lenses, often 
the views of our friends, our family, and even expert sources. In other words, we, and I mean everybody, we look to others to make sense of new information. No matter how educated we are, we look to others for cues or heuristics to get a sense of what to do with this new information. How much priority should we assign to this new piece of information? How should we integrate this new information with our prior knowledge and beliefs? Reading scientific papers doesn't help us with that. We look to others for these kinds of cues. We look to those who we trust to assist in that effort. This kind of trust is called epistemic trust in the philosophy literature. You sometimes see that term in the psychology research too. This is the trust that we assign to others as reliable sources of information. So who do we trust uh, as reliable information sources? There are two parts. We will trust people with the epistemic credentials to be called experts but we also trust those with the moral credibility to report honestly with our interests at heart. So they need to have a good character, not just a lot of letters next to their name. So academic credentials, the letters next to the expert's name, the degrees that they've earned are only part of the consideration when people look around for an information source. Those experts need to be perceived as properly motivated and to have goodwill. This is why the healthcare provider, that personal face, that personal connection to the system can still be trusted even by those who think the healthcare system has been corrupted. In good circumstances, those personal interactions will have earned or maintained the patient's trust in that healthcare provider. A trust is very well studied as a concept in philosophy and sociology and psychology. And the research highlights that trust underlies all successful interactions that are not or cannot be covered by written contracts. It's the things that can't be covered by contracts that need uh, trust. So authority figures sometimes assume they deserve to be trusted and they are frustrated when they do not receive that trust. Yes, it is definitely trust, uh, definitely frustrating for healthcare experts when they need to convince people about healthcare advice like vaccination. It can feel insulting to have one's expertise challenged by a non-expert. But a little bit of charity is needed here when we think about what position the non-expert is in. The non-expert is placed in a vulnerable, vulnerable position in these relationships of trust. The non-expert is constantly at risk of being misled and harmed by trusting the wrong person and taking the wrong advice. So it is right for non-experts to be cautious about who they trust. Now the expert may be justified in thinking that their advice is being inappropriately challenged by a non-expert, but the lesson here isn't that non-experts are wrong sometimes. The lesson here is that it is sometimes difficult for non-experts to know what to do. And this shouldn't elicit frustration or anger. So when you confront your patients and find patients are who are um, hesitant about vaccines, here are some things you can do and shouldn't do in your role as a trusted expert source. One is, uh, don't try to win the debate. Uh, another is don't get frustrated with those who disagree with you. And also don't try to overwhelm the patient with a lot of facts. Surely you have a lot of facts, but this makes people defensive. Instead, you should listen to their concerns and do it sympathetically. You should address their concerns. Sometimes that means providing missing and information. Sometimes that means correcting misinformation, but sometimes it also means admitting that there are things we don't know and that we have to decide under conditions of uncertainty. Certainly don't expect to change people's minds right away. Even if you are very convincing, it takes time. And also be sympathetic to the hardships that people have faced in these very difficult times. Those hardships might make them more resistant to taking a vaccine, even if they are the ones who need it most. Uh, most people, trust vaccines to the extent, extent that they trust the healthcare system and the government. So uh, the people who were made the most vulnerable during the pandemic, and therefore those they would benefit the most from a vaccine, 
are not sure they can trust the vaccines for the same reason that they weren't be kept safe in the first place. Um, and that's because mistrust of the system can run deep. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting, Dr. Maya. And as you may know, nurses, uh, we are ranked as the most trusted professions. No? So, <laughs> so nurses, in, they are in a good position to inform about vaccination to the population. Thank you so much. I would like to invite now our speaker, uh, Mrs. Patricia Patricia Ingram Martin and Patricia is the chief nursing officer of Jamaica and she started her position in 2017. Patricia, you, you have the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Cassiani and the team from PAHO WHO for giving me the opportunity, of course, to share in this very important webinar, which is looking at the advanced practice nurses in the COVID-19 pandemic. I commend Kerry and Marlene on their very insightful presentation, uh, uh, presentations as uh, they, that they have made and I'd also like to congratulate them uh, and their various teams for the hard work and dedication that they maintain as they maintain the fight against COVID-19. There are similarities of the role of the nurse practitioner in Jamaica as those described by Kerry and Marlene. These include the clinical care such as coordinating, managing and facilitating care of patients promoting health system integration, for example, providing access to specialist care through an established referral system, educating staff and system level partners about new practices to support clients in the primary setting um, and the increased care capacity through staff education. There are, however, some marked differences. The advanced practice nurses group in Jamaica includes the nurse anesthetist, the family nurse practitioner, and the mental health nurse practitioner, all combined totaling just over 100 persons, a very small group. The advanced practice registered nurses practice by way of a policy from the Ministry of Health and Wellness due to the fact that in Jamaica, they are not governed by a legislative framework. And therefore, they are not as autonomous as they should. They are supervised directly or indirectly by the medical practitioner. They have limited prescriptive rights, meaning they can write prescriptions. However, these prescriptions have to be countersigned by the medical officer. Other marked differences is that the Jamaican nurse practitioner predominantly works in primary healthcare setting. Though they see a wide range of medical conditions, a great number of the clients they see are those in the NCDs curative clinics with chronic conditions. As it relates to their role during the COVID-19 pandemic, although the numbers are small, that is 42 um, nurse practitioners in all, they play a big role. They are engaged in screening and identifying clients with respiratory illnesses, facilitate and administer appropriate treatment. They prescribe diagnostic tests and perform COVID-19 swabbing for testing. They are engaged in the isolation of clients and make referrals as necessary. They also are involved in COVID-19 surveillance to include contact tracing as they participated in, and they participate in educational and sensitization sessions of both staff and clients alike, 
and the community during the pandemic. They are a part of the emergency operating centers or command centers participating in the development of various health protocols and various audit tools, mainly relating to infection prevention and control. Nurse practitioners also conduct home visits, especially for the elderly who have to be at home as part of the COVID-19 protocols. They assess, provide treatment and make referrals for further management as necessary. Now, in addition to the family nurse practitioner, there are two other categories, as I had indicated before, that um, of nurses who fall under the umbrella of the advanced practice registered nurses. They are the mental health nurse practitioner and the nurse anesthetist. Now, the mental health nurse practitioner, uh, we have just about 25 of them here in Jamaica. And as the name suggests, they take care of the mental aspect of persons. And during the COVID-19, these nurses participate in mental health promotion and education with special focus on coping with the COVID-19 anxiety, depression, um, acute stress, drug misuse, and suicidal behaviors during emergencies. They conduct home visits of persons who were unable or refused to access mental health care. Example, the people who are of the older age who first have difficulty um, getting to the healthcare center. They participate in the implementation of telemental health as one strategy to commence assessment of clients prior to face-to-face -face contact in order to minimize patient contact time in the clinics and, make, and they make calls to delinquent clients. Now, there is also the provision of psychosocial support and the treatment for persons in quarantine and isolation facilities. And uh, they also engage in counseling as it relates to the vaccine. Now, uh, they, we also believe that um, cross-training is also important. So for the nurse, we will now look at the nurse anesthetist. The role of the nurse anesthetist is to provide anesthesia care for patients requiring surgery. And during the COVID-19, these nurses were assigned to more cases as the surgeons were at times assigned to other duties. They provide guidance and support to the critical care nurses in intensive care units um, who were caring for COVID-19 patients. They provide assistance in airway management to junior doctors and interns when medical staff were assigned to other areas of the service. In case of emergency, they do perform uh, the COVID-19 testing before persons actually have their surgery. Now looking at the lessons learned from the two presentations and areas that we think we can uh, adapt or adopt to strengthen our situation here. I particularly like the nurse-led outreach team strategy in Kerry's presentation. I believe that this strategy would be quite beneficial to the Jamaican health system to provide care to the sick and shut-ins, whether it be in their homes or in the long-term care setting. Also, our, nurse, our family nurse practitioners conduct home visits. It is, however, not on a regular basis. This concept would be more organized and would see the nurse practitioner having greater autonomy as they plan and implement care as the team leaders. The after hospital discharge care is another area that we think we would be able to develop and would be able to link it, of course, with a nurse-led outreach strategy in an effort to decrease readmissions to hospitals. There is a need for more research into aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic, which can strengthen our management in similar situations in the future. 
I must concur with Marlene that it takes strong leadership to help during chaotic situations. And so we must continue to strengthen our leadership capabilities. Indeed, our advanced practice nurses are a part of the hero team of frontline workers who have been toiling relentlessly in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, in concluding, just a little bit about where we are coming from and where we are at. The advanced practice nurses, registered nurses in Jamaica, like in the United States and Canada, are well-trained at the master's level for four years where they develop various competencies. They, however, are not able to practice to the full extent of their training, as currently there is no regulatory framework guiding the practice of these groups. Their education, training, and practice, however, are recognized by stakeholders in the Ministry of Health and Wellness and Nursing Council of Jamaica. The matter of implementing legislation for the advanced practice nurse has been under uh, discussion since the early 1980s. From the latest review in 2021, the agreed recommendation is, was for there to be an amendment of the Nurses and Midwives Act of 1964. Now, at that time, we never had advanced practice nurses, so they were not included in our Nurses and Midwives Act. Now to amend the Nurses and Midwives Act to allow for prescriptive authority of our advanced practice nurse require that the competencies, standards and scope of practice that will govern their practice must be established. This document was established and is many years now and it is still being reviewed, but we continue to make representation and we are hopeful that this document will be approved as without a legal framework and the full recognition of our advanced practice nurses, we will continue to have nurses not willing to enter this field of expanded scope of practice, resulting in very low numbers like what we have now. I see the great work that our advanced practice nurses are doing uh, through, though they are few in numbers, in this COVID-19 pandemic. There is, great, there is even greater potential for advanced practice nurses to strengthen both the primary and secondary healthcare services in Jamaica in the future. And so we continue to press on uh, so that they can practice their skills to the full extent of their education and training. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Patricia Ingram, it was very good to hear about Jamaica, about your impressions. And I'm sure with your leadership, you no, know, we will be working with the regulators, you know, to expand the scope of practice okay. and the autonomy of the uh, advanced practice nurses in Jamaica and, and also impact the whole Caribbean in terms of their scope mm -hmm. of practice. Thank you very, very much. And, and I want to invite now uh, our speaker, you'll be uh, Maestra Claudia Leija Hernandez. Claudia, and now I'm going back to Spanish. Claudia. Uh, Claudia has a master's in Business Administration in Health Organizations in from the La Salle University with a bachelor's in nursing and obstetrics from the National Nursing and Obstetrics School from the National Autonomous University of Mexico and graduate in hospital epidemiology and research and strategic planning. It will be a pleasure for us to hear your experience in Mexico and what Mexico has done in terms of implementing the role of the practicing nurses or the nurse practitioner, I'm sorry. Uh, Claudia, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Silvia, and good afternoon to all of you. I want to congratulate the Pan-American Health Organization for this webinar. 
and particularly my colleagues, Carrie and Marlene, for their presentations, particularly sharing the importance of these advanced roles in, during the pandemic. In the few minutes I have available, I'd like to share with you three different approaches. My first is the role of uh, nurses during the COVID-19 pandemic in our country, which was very similar to what we heard from our colleagues, but highlighting what developed very rapidly and immediately amongst the nurses here in Mexico. The first was a national training program, particularly because in our country, we have a significant number of nurses. We're talking about more than 300,000 nurses, but as to direct care during the pandemic, we were talking about more than 100,000. In a health system, which is pretty fragmented and is facing many communication challenges, and yet it was very important for us to have a national training program, program during the pandemic, particularly to minimize the risks and the uncertainty and the fear and anxiety. With this national training program, we reached thousands of nurses, uh, specifically regarding the behavior in light of the virus, the SARS-CoV-2, and what the clinical picture was at the beginning of the pandemic, as well as all the aspects of the care of patients with COVID. And it included the rapid training in the use of the PPEs. At the beginning in our country, we had a lot of problems of access, which created a lot of concern and uncertainty. And of course, having the equipment and being able to use it correctly was very urgent, particularly to reduce the contagion risks. The training program also was very quick, despite the deficit we have of nurses in our country to care in this, these times of pandemic and not to collapse the health system. We hired 36,000 nurses. And the challenge was not only to add them to the system, but the need to develop their necessary competences so that the group could respond efficiently to the care of patients. Another important aspect I wanted to highlight is the care for the uh, medical staff. There was a lot of concern in the health institutions in treating and dealing with the uh, health staff and deal with their mental health, their fear, their anxiety, the need to change drastically their environment and their care and also the need to establish rest for the uh, health staff. There was hotels which were made available so that these people could rest. All of these were very important aspects that were required to help them be able to respond to this need. A year after the pandemic, I want to share that this continues to be a share for us, um, challenge for us, I'm sorry. The staff is very tired and we need to continue to offer support in mental health and rest for our medical staff. Another important role of the nurses during the pandemic is the care for patients and how to respond to the practical guidelines and the immediate care plans to offer timely care. And later during the pandemic, the teleconsultations. Our country um, has a problem with the telehealth because of the digital barriers, but in the cities, the role, the nursing role has been very important insofar as teleconsult and the follow-up of patients at home. This is the first part of my comments, the important role of nurses during the COVID pandemic. The second comment I want to focus on the fact that our country, though we still don't have, I'm sorry, her microphone cut off, for these uh, nurse practitioners, I wanna mention here in the second part that we expanded the role of the nurses and professional progress of the specialties in our country, which has responded to the health needs. And one of them, which I wanna stress is the uh, extension of sexual and reproductive nurses. This is a good component of birth control, prenatal care, birth care, we have 10 to 12 models in our country. 
And we have the challenge of enlarging the model that we have and expanding uh, this model, especially when it comes to adolescent pregnancies. The words are being cut off. The speaker's words are being cut off. At the national level, we have about 200 clinics under the leadership of nurses. And nurses there make sure that uh, all hospitalizations are classified so that patients are not unduly admitted uh, long term. Also, we have several mechanisms uh, for follow up and treatment. This has been very important for the role of nurses because hospitalizations have been diminished and especially uh, nurses have been actively working in the placement of IV lines and uh, especially in the care of patients with tuberculosis and all of these place challenges to the nursing role in our country. However, I will now focus on a third point. In Mexico, we are looking for the standardization and expansion of the role of advanced care nurses. We have two universities that are working on curricula for advanced practice nursing to be able to care for the local population. Within these programs, it is necessary to consider the professional advancement of nurses. At the present time, 40% of Mexican nurses are trained at the specialty level. And we have been offering systematized and standardized programs for advancement. Mexico has very serious challenges in our health uh, system. For instance, we have a large number of amputations of the lower limbs because of diabetes. Also, we have problems in the care of sexual and reproductive healthcare patients. At the present time, we are reorganizing the human resource aspects of our healthcare system, but we have to work to make sure that we have good human resources, well distributed, and that have a proper combination of skills and patient and family centered work. And this is the way in which the Secretary of Health is proposing care at the first level. And also, we are focusing on the role of nurses being expanded to diabetic patients, and also in the field of sexual and reproductive health. This is a strategy that has been focused on for several months. We have been working on the labor and education aspects. Who is going to train all these nurses? What will be their salaries? Many times also the Ministry of Health has worked with the Ministry of Education to make sure, for instance, that nurses are able to prescribe a specific list of medicines. We are working very hard on the expansion of the nursing role so that they can follow up certain patients and they have the training and capacity to do so. We have been working on the field of diabetic, diabetics and we have uh, nurses from eight federal institutions right now on our list and we are working on the indicators. Uh, for this particular particular practice. We still have to work on specific results for follow-up to make sure that we document the importance of nurses in the expansion of these roles. And we hope that in the very near future, we will have 
advanced care nurses. I emphasize the need to have cross-cutting training for nurses so that they can be this deployed to one field or to another field. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Claudia. Very, very interesting how Mexico has been advancing in their discussion. And they are talking about diabetes and the expansion plan to uh, for the role of nurses. This is really interesting uh, to accompany this in the region uh, and the work that has been developed in Mexico. Thank you so much for your leadership. Now I will go to some questions. We have a lot of questions in the chat, but I wanted to say that we will be taking these questions and we will be sending them to the speakers so that they can uh, answer them. Uh, I would like to make uh, a question to Carrie and uh, Carrie, please be very, very short in your answer. But the question is, during this time of COVID, the pandemic, do you think that it's a right time to discuss about the scope of practice of the, of the nurse practitioner or not? And why do you think about this? I, I think this is an opportune time to speak about the role of nurse practitioners. Um, I think we've seen the COVID has really identified the need and the opportunity for more advanced scope and practice. And we've seen that in long-term care, not only for the direct clinical care and management, but also the system leadership, integration and coordination of care with specialists, hospitals, as well as supporting the nurses um, and the staff within the home, especially those homes that have a COVID outbreak. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And Marlene, do you do you have the same answer? Do you think that it's right to discuss oh, yeah. during this time with so yeah. many with so many difficulties related to COVID in the countries? I do. Um, and I think that New York State is a model that people can look at. There was legislation passed early in the COVID epidemic that expanded scope of practice for all advanced practice nurses in the state. And I think without that, the health systems would not have been able to function and provide the level of care that they needed. So I think this is an opportune time for people to look at um, expanding scope of practice, but I would reference the New York state law. And if I have it somewhere, I can find the link um, mm -hmm. that really expands scope of practice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And thinking about the future, what do you expect in terms of the future of the APN after the pandemic? Um, it's going to be interesting. Um, APNs have assumed a tremendous role in the U.S. Um, and they have been billing, you know, we are a, a fee for, we bill for our services. So it's going to be interesting what happens after COVID and other providers are back in their specialized areas seeing patients, whether nurse practitioners will continue to have <clears throat> um, the ability to bill as they have during the pandemic. But I think this, the, the role for nurse practitioners will continue. What I do think COVID did teach us is that we need to have role flexibility and education. And the siloing of nurse practitioners is going to be a question that needs to be discussed. RNs are not siloed, but NPs are siloed in most of their educational preparation. And I'm not sure that we're gonna be able to continue that moving forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and Claudia, uh, about the education, Claudia, escuchando sobre educación, que Marlene acaba de hablar, Marlene has just talked about education. How do you see the role of the educational system 
in the formation of advanced care nursing staff and how do we prepare in terms of education? Yes, thank you so much, Silvia. First of all, we have to have constant and efficient communication with the educational system. For us, this has been very important in the past few months here in our country, and especially with leadership institutions in matters of human resources. We have to make sure that the people's needs are made clear and we have to work uh, with these authorities. We have conducted joint analysis uh, with the university in our country. And we have to consider the results and the evidence around the world and the input of nurses in advanced practice. And this has improved the health system. The third point that I want to underline is that we have develop the Mexican skills framework for nursing. I know that uh, we talk about advanced care disease, but we just uh, talk about diseases uh, for uh, care by advanced nursing roles. So we have to make sure that we emphasize the advanced role of nursing staff as uh, defined by the uh, Council of Nursing. So I go back to emphasizing the importance of working together to be able to adapt knowledge and priorities required by the advanced care nursing staff, especially in primary health care. And also this has to be geared towards the main health institution. Communication should be efficient we have to work jointly to be able to reap the benefits and to define the roles and then to build a strategy together. Thank you so much. That's excellent. I'm going to Patricia and then uh, I will leave Maya by the end. Maya, there are several questions to you. I think that we, we should invite you again next time because there are many, many questions. But Patricia, uh, do you think that the pandemic, you no, know, and in the way that you are working in Jamaica, should or could change this situation in terms of regulations of the APMs in Jamaica? Patricia? Yes, yes, I am here. Right, I do think it is an opportunity for us. Uh, we, the advanced practice nurses, we were just speaking about that. And um, they, one of the things that we have been speaking about is being visible and uh, making themselves um, be available and uh, for them to, to show their importance. And certainly we have come up with an idea that once we are able to establish that system where we can uh, be more, more um, visible, being out there, providing care, letting um, our, 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 our collaborators know that we are there not to threaten them, you know, but to collaborate with them and to provide that level of care for our clients then I believe persons will start to open up and will allow us to be able to uh, practice, you know, to the, the full extent of our training. Um, and so I believe once we pass that hurdle, then the, the pathway would be cleared for the legislative part arm of it to come into play. But I, I, I do see, uh, we do have a plan where we can uh, show our importance a little bit more. I think one of the challenges because our numbers are so few, but, and so this is why we have to come up with a good plan to show, you know, that we are very important to the health system. We are now about to look at the public health um, primary care renewal in the Ministry of Health. And we want to show that we are very important to this process and to, to, to limit hospitalization. And so we can do more, 
out there. And so this is what we are working on. And as I said before, I believe if we're able to accomplish this, then it would be a springboard to get in um, a clearer pathway to the legislative changes that are needed. Yeah. And it, it is a case of investment, you know, the numbers Perfect. can increase, include yes. of the APN. Thank you, Patricia. And, and, and Maya, as I said, there are several questions and to your uh, 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 to your time, you know, but, but I selected two. The first one that it's very interesting, and, and the question is, how about if the healthcare providers are hesitant to you know? And the second one is that people are asking the providers if they should take this or that vaccine. And they are Googling, you no, know? they are in the Google to find out. Uh, what they should they should take, you know, and how is the role of the healthcare providers in this case? Okay, um, the first question. This has been a very interesting phenomena with uh, the early stages of COVID rollout uh, in uh, Europe and uh, U.S. Uh, mainly. That it was everybody was surprised that there was hesitancy among healthcare workers. Um, and uh, of course, it created uh, some difficulty around the early rollout because the healthcare healthcare providers, the front of the line healthcare providers, were supposed to be the easy ones to vaccinate. The expectation was that they would all line up to get vaccinated very willingly. So this, of course, wasn't expected. Any concerns about vaccine hesitancy, and there have been concerns from well before we even had a vaccine, it was always thinking about the public. Surely the public will have it. And I think that 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 kind of thinking didn't sort of recognize that healthcare workers are people too. And because of that, healthcare workers will have some of the same concerns that the general public does. It is not the case that just because healthcare workers are uh, scientifically literate and uh, well-educated and of course facing a risk associated with the work that they do with patients that they will all see the risk benefit um, point in favor of vaccination. So healthcare workers have the same concerns that the public does about this new vaccine using a new platform. There's much that we don't know about it. Uh, concerns that maybe it was rushed to market because of the urgency of it. All those are all concerns that need to be adequately addressed. Um, also, this is very anecdotal, but some of them, some of the concerns are particular to healthcare workers being the first. They don't have the luxury of saying, I'll just wait until other people do. There are many people who say, I want to be vaccinated, but I don't want to be first. They want to see what happens in, in the first cohort. So um, if anything, healthcare workers need need chances to collect information and think it through, uh, just like everyone else does. And of course, it is sometimes hard to get the information that we need. When the vaccines first came out, for example, it was hard to tell whether the information we are hearing in the newspapers were from press releases from Pfizer and Moderna or whether it was independently vetted information. And that shouldn't be hard to find out. So the, the big error was not having educational rollout for healthcare workers, many of whom are exhausted from the many months of hard work. So they don't have time to really sit and think through the issue. Um, I'm aware uh, where I live in Canada that there's been a lot of effort to try to help healthcare workers through this instead of to sort of be shocked and, and uh, and uh, dismayed that healthcare workers are hesitating. There's been nightly webinars, Zoom meetings directed at healthcare workers, especially personal support workers who seem to be the most uh, hesitant about vaccines. And, and I'll speak to that in, in, in a minute. Um, to let them ask questions and not feel shy about asking questions just because they're the ones that are supposed to be supporting vaccination and, and telling the public to get vaccinated. Now, what I want to say about personal support workers, they are among the most hesitant in, in the many countries that have been tracking vaccine hesitancy. And the reason for this might be more with the lived situation than uh, of these workers. In, in Canada, they are largely racialized and immigrant women. So they come to 
vaccination with a lot of the same concerns that their communities have around mistrusting healthcare, which is sometimes racist and is sometimes uh, d does not uh, uh, serve the needs of racialized people and understand their concerns and treat them with with compassion. So they they have have many of the sort of community and socially based resistances that just because you're a healthcare worker, it doesn't mean that those completely erase and that you are 100% supportive uh, of science. So, so the answer to that is, is that's the reason healthcare workers are hesitant is because they are like everybody else and they have questions and concerns that need to be uh, addressed adequately and with compassion. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we, we came to the end of the webinar. Again, I want to thank all the participants, the speakers, Marlene, Kerry, Patricia, Maya, and Claudia. It was wonderful to have you in this webinar. I want to thank again all the team from PAHO, no, all the team that is working with this, this webinar, we had almost 500 participants. The, the webinar was recorded, so it will be a pleasure to share with you the recorded webinar so you can share to others so we can have this information to others as well. Also, the co-organizers, the university, of Columbia School of Nursing, University of McMaster School of Nursing. My colleagues, Dr. Denise uh, Brian Lukosius, Dr. Andrea Bauman, and Dr. Jennifer Dorn for this opportunity to work with you and to have this webinar. Thank you again, and we are come to the end. Bye-bye, and hope to see you again in our next webinar. Thank you very much.